Hello, this is Chris with Battle Beaver Customs, and today we were able to get our hands on the new PlayStation 5 or DualSense controller and wanted to do a walkthrough teardown video to showcase um, some of what I observed by opening this controller a few times. Did a couple videos previously where we installed custom thumbsticks and our D buttons. Um, so just wanted to show you what was in there. You know, we have been following all the speculation like everyone else as far as different textures and designs and stuff. And I feel like a few things were missed along the way. Um, so, to give you an idea, we're going to be comparing a lot of it to the current DualShock 4 controller. So, this is a controller we have built on for the last seven years. And here is our new Battle Beaver case. And it is was built for the DualShock 4 and it happens to hold the DualSense 5 controller perfectly. So if you buy one of these today, this is your first accessory that will be cross compatible. We also went ahead and had a custom USB type C cable made. And I feel like that was something that was missed, but there's a fantastic USB type C port on the top of this controller. So to give you some ideas of what I've observed, um, I'll go inside and out. The biggest thing on the outside, this controller is a little bit wider. It is a little bit heavier. Um, we'll actually post the specific weights compared with this to say like an Astro C40 controller where it is a little bit lighter than a C40 controller, but it does outweigh both a DualShock 4 and an Xbox One S controller. Coming in close to the Astro C40 weight and not quite up to what an Xbox Elite controller would weigh. One big design feature that I did notice, so they did change the profile, the sizing, um, but for the first time, Sony has strayed away from a flat plane on their face buttons. And what I mean by that is if you look down at these face buttons, you'll notice that the O button tapers with the shell compared to a DualShock controller where there's a very flat surface, flat for both sides. Um, when you held the controller, there was kind of an edge here, but your button presses were always straight down. It helped <clears throat> a lot for claw players um, to be able to reach around and have an even playing field on that. So it is a little bit different. The spacing on the buttons seems to very, be very similar, but it feels wider a lot just because of the taper. The controller itself, as far as thickness goes, if you go bottom of trigger to bottom of trigger, you can see the actual thickness of the controller is considerably bigger. <clears throat> so that is something to note. The controller itself is a little bit bigger, feels a little bit heavier. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and start opening it up. So a few things we took note of is you have this black trim piece right here in the middle. And that trim piece is hiding your first two screws. Naturally, you would want to go to any gap and start prying out the trim piece. Well, if you pry from right here, you risk bending that part, and that is directly under where you'd be looking as you're playing. So we found some better spots to pry from. It should be down here at the bottom. So as this wraps around at the bottom, you can see a little bit of a gap right here. I'm using some tweezers that are custom made. I say custom made. Hit them with a grinder and sanding wheel. This is what we have. But you can get in right under here. I had to pull up. <clears throat> Once you start from the bottom, you just pull this portion forward, pulling the middle part up, come up over the thumbsticks, and then you pull this up and out. So the first piece that comes off the controller is this little trim color piece. And I foresee this being something that is produced. Um, see a lot of this probably on Amazon. I'll see a lot of gaming companies like ours that will be possibly selling these in different colors, different designs because you can pop this on and off without affecting your controller without opening any screws without voiding any warranties this is a purely aesthetic option that clips on and off so really good to have 
and that will give you access to your first two screws here on the bottom. So if you were to just take these two out and start opening the controller, you'd rip it in half. Your other two screws are a little bit more hidden. They are under your R1 and L1 buttons. <clears throat> Easiest way to get to those is to take some straight tweezers or you can take a pry bar. I would pull your R2 all the way down, come in right under this bumper and lift backwards. And do the same thing on the other side. All right. And you can see here we have two more screws right on the inside of the controller. So we'll go ahead and get those out and we will start getting into this actual monster. On the face button and the D-pads, you will notice that they have like a clear sheen to them. It seems like they were injected once with a UV clear type cap and then color was added behind it which is something we've seen before, well, kind of for the first time would have been the Xbox One where they did the double injected. Um, the difference is you can tell the letters in here are more printed on the white portion of the letter. You know, we would love to see those raised up a little bit, but I'm sure we'll get more as this console progresses. So to open this controller, get the four screws out, start in the corner, pry it up a little bit, you can hit this first clip, go on the other side, start pulling on this corner, and then pry up there. To get those two clips, you can push with your thumbs to start popping your other clips. And then this whole rear shell will rotate off of the controller, like so, and then just pop off. So there you have it. There's your rear shell, comes right off. Uh, you will notice the texture on this rear shell is a little bit more of like a matte sandpaper mm. sort of texture. If you look really close, the rear shell is actually the symbols, the X square circle triangle symbols. You have to look really close to see it, which is a really cool feature on this controller. Um, it was speculated that the front would also be that way but the front is definitely a more of a satin finish. It's smooth here. There's no texture bumps on the touchpad. There's no texture really on this insert piece. So the rear shell texture compared to a DualShock 4 is considerably different. Um, and I actually prefer the, the DualSense rear shell over the current one that's on the DualShock. So now that we're here, we're gonna go ahead and take the battery out. Removing batteries. You want to grab as close to the connector as you can. Kind of work it back and forth, pull it out. Don't just pull in the cables. You don't want to rip the wires out of that connector. This will expose your first screw, which will take off the battery tray. Get that one out. And right here we have a rear microphone. So to remove that, you can lightly pull up here. And you can twist this backwards and that will allow it to be free. And then if you just pull straight up and out, that microphone will come out undamaged. And then from there you can remove your battery tray. And now we have access to a little bit more of the controller. So we have these two large ribbons here that control the L1, L2, R1, R2 assemblies. Um, down here we have another microphone, and up here will be your touchpad X and Y axis plus the touchpad click. So we'll get all these removed. Remember when removing ribbon cables to always pry from this extra piece here. Don't pull on the actual cable, if at all possible. Um, these cables are very fragile, and there are, are not replacements for them yet, so keep that in mind. When it comes to the touchpad one, try to pull from this blue portion, not the white part of the cable. And same down here with the microphone. All right. Since we're going in a little bit deeper today, we are going to be taking the rumbles out of the controller to show those off and want to get them out of the way. 
on my other videos, I showed that you can just tilt the board forward or backwards and kind of work with it as one piece. But we want to go ahead and get this out. So we're going to desolder them. If you wanted to just remove your rumbles, you could do so by just simply clipping these wires. Uh, but our part of this teardown video is going to also be putting it all the way back together, which doesn't always happen in teardown videos. So we want to leave it as intact as possible. So that'll allow your main board to come free, which we will review a lot more, don't worry. Come back to that. And here we have what I would consider the mid plate and the face plate. So the mid plate being the large black section. And to free these two, we have four screws. So two on the outside and then two right here in the middle that are silver. The reason I point out the difference in the color of the screws are these two silver screws are a little bit longer than the outside black screws. So you want to make sure that they go back in the same position because if you were to use them to say close the rear shell and you put it in one of those corner spots, it would be longer than the hole that it's going into, which then could damage your faceplate, leave some blemishes on the shell. Uh, just one of those forehead slap kind of moments. So we're gonna avoid that at all possible. Get that out. Go ahead and pull this old mid plate out. So now we have the controller into what we would consider the main functional pieces. Face plate, mid plate, main board, rear shell. Um, so what we're gonna do, we're just gonna start from the top and work our way in and then we're gonna put it back together. So when we start with the face plate, we'll notice the touchpad. Um, it does move around a little bit. Can Now that it's here, you can free it if you just tilt it forward with a little bit of force the whole assembly will come out. You'll see this assembly on the outside is a translucent clear plastic. So it is a light diffuser. There are LEDs that hit this part of the touchpad. We'll go ahead and open it up. And this will come right off. And then this exposes our touchpad. So different than the DualShock 4, the DualShock 4, the touchpad button, the actual click of the touchpad was on the board itself. Um, and then the touchpad worked as <clears throat> the device that pressed that button. So here it's backwards. And then at the bottom, we have these five LEDs, which will be pushing straight into that diffuser from the bottom. Uh, Going off how Sony normally does stuff, I'm also going to assume those are full RGB LEDs and that that surround around the touchpad will change colors based on what player you are or any other indicators within the game. So pretty, pretty neat feature to have. I think it will serve better than the line that was in the DS4 touchpad or the the white bar that was on the front. Very subtle, you can see it, but since it is a diffused plastic, it won't be blinding you at night. So there we have it for the touchpad. So when it comes down to the face buttons, this is fairly similar to other models we've seen. Uh, we have rubber contact pads holding in the button and the D-pad. The D-pad again is a single piece D-pad, which you can see has that clear cap going on it, which gives it a really unique look. There is an extra tab here on the bottom to know which direction it goes in. Um, but a DS4 current D-pad will fit in there. So they are the exact same size. On the face buttons, we did notice something a little different is you take these face buttons out. Now you can see the actual slope of the outside of that face button as it contours the faceplate. So that'd be very similar to what a B button would be on an Xbox One controller, which is awesome. And then we have this gray piece of silicone with an arrow pointing up. And the first few times I took this controller apart, I kept coming back to it trying to figure out what this piece was actually for. You can pry it out and it is, it's a bit chunky. So here we go, it's about a little over a quarter inch thick 
this big piece of thick silicone. What I noticed is that on the silicone, there are tabs cut out, and that would be where the face buttons rebound to. So, comparing to our DualShock controller, if when you click it and you release the button, that plastic button is coming up and hitting the plastic shell. And that's what gives that very kind of loud metal or plastic on plastic clink. Where this, when the button's in, the rebound is going to be hitting that silicone pad, which will act as like a, a sound buffer while still getting full travel and full rebound. So a unique feature they added in there. Um, don't think that's on the back of the box, but it does make the controller a little bit quieter to play, maybe a little less annoying, which we're all about that. We have our two rubber contact pads, and I highlighted this in our D button video, but these contact pads are a lot softer. They, they're, the way they measure these, there's a grams force of input pressure to click each of these buttons. And whatever they chose to do here, it is softer than what a DualShock 4 rubber contact pad would have been. We call them rubber contact pads, they're made out of silicone, they have carbon pads that hit the face buttons. But this is definitely stiffer. So if you were to put this in the controller, your buttons would feel a little bit crisper, they would take a little bit more input pressure, um, whereas the DualSense pad is going to feel a little bit mushier, a little bit softer, um, the rebound may not feel as crisp, mm. the press may not feel as crisp, so it is something to keep in mind. We do sell the rubber contact pads a la carte on our website, so if you're searching for that little bit stiffer input, you can actually take, and this contact pad just fits. So the button spacing is identical to PS4. Um, the contact pad fits in perfectly, which will give you a crisper input. So there's a small little token to take with you. You can do the same thing on the D-pad side. And if you really wanted to, you can do the same thing on the PS button. Although the PS button, their new shape is drastically different than the circle they had before. They went with the PlayStation logo, which is really neat. I think we'll have to make those in clear at some point, throw some LEDs in there just to show that off some more. You will notice down here we have another light diffuser. This light diffuser is going through to the face, which looks to be a microphone mute button. So this moves. This is a button that clicks a small switch on the main board and has an LED. So in I think what will happen is you'll press that button to mute your microphones. Um, and if it's a microphone mute button, I'm willing to bet that LED is an amber color. So there's that. You'll notice on the back we have this, the back of the circle here that's checkerboarded. These are actual inserts for the thumbstick. So thumbstick rings, the first time we saw these in our shop was on the Xbox One Elite controller. So the plastic they use in here is a little bit higher polished. The idea is that they wear better. They add some contrasting color flair. Um, I mean, take them or leave them, but they are going to be in the controller. They don't seem to be easily replaceable. The Xbox ones, you can, oh, there it goes. You can lightly just pop them out. These ones look a little bit more forced. It's, you can see they kind of hook into the faceplate, so we're gonna try our hardest to see if we can get that back in there. Unfortunately, they're not quite big enough. If they made these just a little bit bigger, if you pop them out, you could then remove your thumbstick without having to take your controller apart. So it's like they got really close to a great idea and then left it where it is. So, and if you've gamed quite a bit, you know your thumbsticks wear out. It's just part of it. Plastic on plastic, no lubrication, it just starts to wear away. It's nothing against who they made it or how they made it. It's just 
how friction works. All right, so we'll get this touchpad back in the faceplate. I think we've covered pretty much everything here. Everything straightforward. The front microphone seems to be attached to the faceplate. The option share buttons are removable again. So we've seen that off and on um, with the DualShock 4. So happy to see that those are removable again, which means eventually we'll get to offer those in custom colors. So get those back in and we'll put this off to the side. The next portion and probably the most exciting part of this controller is the mid plate itself. So we do a lot of professional gamers. The number one thing that they like to take out of their controller are rumbles. And these rumbles are massive. They are not the same style of rumble that they we've had in previous controllers where they're a rotating vibration motor. These This actually has a, I think like a floating magnet. You can feel it move back and forth. Um, I've heard some other terms for it. It's a very different way for the rumble to work and it's not identical to what the Switch Pro controller uses where it's using a smaller sliding rumble. So I'll be interested to see how they utilize these, but competitive players really just don't like rumbles. These are heavy, so if you want to take them out, you can see an access point right here where you can see the rumble through the mid plate and right here. But you can take something heavy, I'm using needle noses, and hold the mid plate firmly and just press on this and it'll pop out. And all you're really popping out is a piece of 3M adhesive that holds that thing in there. So Rumble, manufactured by Foster. I'll probably look them up more later, see exactly what they do, what this is. But if you hit it on the ground, it's almost, or on the table, it almost feels like a, a speaker moving in and out. Like it has coils moving around a magnet. Maybe that's how it works, who knows. I have to do some more digging. We'll, crack that puppy open at some point and see two screws here on the the top of the mid plate um, these screws are going to release the l1 l2 r1 r2 assemblies or we'll we'll just call them trigger bumper mechanisms i don't there's not a we don't have a fancy word for it yet so we'll just take one of these out show you what we got here so this piece is it's pretty big um, actually, we'll tear that down in a second. We'll, we'll get inside of it. Should go over a couple other things here. This silicone piece is where the option cherries hit, and there's a little protrusion that will actually hit the little switches that are on the main board, um, giving a little more tactile feel. Normal con flexible contact pad that goes through the controller using friction contacts. There are 10 traces here. There's nine buttons on the front. So that would let me know these nine buttons plus one ground. So these are probably all a common ground type setup, um, which good to know if you're in the type of business that we're in, we're going to duplicate buttons and such. Dealing with common ground makes life a little bit easier. We do have another clear plastic piece that looks like it's going to diffuse some LEDs or transfer light up to this portion. And then what sits right under here would be the top of the touchpad. So I know when you press the PlayStation button, these are the actual lights that come on right now before the controller actually syncs up to something. So these are the ones that come on first and it looks like they're originating from the middle, which will make more sense here in a second. So if we take this bumper and trigger assembly, we can kind of show you what this looks like. So you have your L1, your L2, and it runs in here. This is our ribbon that connects it to the main board, going into this accessory board, and then another blue ribbon coming off to the side. You'll notice this blue ribbon, the same color as our flex ribbon, and it's also going under the L1, L2. So my thoughts are that this is the actual inputs for your L1 and L2. And then the actual inputs plus this rotating potentiometer and this motor that's being controlled would be your output coming on this cable. So 
I want to show you what's going on on the inside of this thing. So if you were to take this and turn this potentiometer manually. So if you were to duplicate what the motor is doing, as you turn this potentiometer, you'll see this arm come out. So we can't get this to focus a little bit. So that arm just swings out. Um, and that was that is what will actually stop your trigger from moving. So what I have read is that if they wanted to simulate your gun jamming in a game, this motor would spin, it would kick this thing up, and then you just wouldn't be able to pull your trigger until your jam was cleared, and then that would retract, allowing you full movement and full input again. So very, very interested to see how game developers are able to take advantage of that. Um, we have also seen that you can disable this feature in the settings. So if history repeats itself, the a lot of our clients that are you know professional gamers, they're going to play with that predominantly disabled um, as it you know counteracts against the way they're using the controller, which means we would also remove this motor just because it's I mean it's pretty hefty in weight. So to show you what the gear looks like on the inside, you can undo this ribbon right here. Can't get a good hold of it. I'll expose this screw here at the bottom. And we have these screws here on the back. And I don't recommend messing with this part of your controller too much. If you're just digging around just to see how things work um, and you don't really have an end goal, this is a portion that you could mess up. And if you lose the functionality, you may not be too thrilled about it. So here you can see the rotating part of that motor and the piece of the trigger that it moves into position. So this is just a spinning worm gear. You will notice that this motor has a start and a stop point. Um, so if you move it all the way to the top, if you look real close, you can see the number two on this gear. I'm willing to bet that number may be different in each controller, but just remember what number is facing straight down. Because as you pull this top piece off, and you'll notice there's a, a spring in here. Make sure you don't lose that. And you have this gear. So this gear has half of the teeth locked out, and that's to prevent it from overextending in either direction. So a start and a stop. You can actually pull this whole gear out as well. And which is funny, there's no lubrication in here. So this is just plastic on plastic. I kind of expected to see some white gear lubricant. Um, and then you can even pull this entire housing out. So if you are removing this, you could just snip these wires, take this whole portion, throw it off to the side, put the casing back on it, put this back in the controller, and you would save quite a few grams. But for now, we're just gonna put it back together how it was when we got here. So that's facing down. You can look, verify that number two is still on the bottom. Take this gear. Got it just a little bit out of sync. So outside of Battle Beaver, I've rebuilt a winch on my Jeep a few years back, and I got to learn what gear timing was all about. So now I'm a lot more cautious when I'm opening and removing gears, knowing that they all want to go back in a very specific place. Put the casing back on there. All right. So I'm excited to see how they utilize this portion of the controller in games. I think this is something extremely unique. Obviously, no one has attempted to fight against your trigger input. So is you hit like the rumble strips in a racing game, 
they can actually push against what would be your gas pedal or if you're sliding through the gravel because your ABS failed and your tires are locked up, you know, they could actually lock out your brake pedal. So I think there's a, a lot of good that can come from this. So I would hate to have to take it out too many times. And we'll just put this back in the controller. So it just pops right back into there. Make sure everything lines up. Two screws here on the top. Say from a development standpoint and what my company does, we will be spending more time getting that trigger assembly modified to use our smart triggers to convert these to almost like a mouse click. So there, there's a lot to work with here, um, but hopefully we'll have something done here very quickly. So get those out, make sure everything's in the right spot. And we'll go ahead and get this rumble motor put back in because we do want to leave it how we found it. You notice that they have a cutout for the Foster QR tag. So maybe that QR could be, I guess, a serial for the rumbles itself, but they scanned it after it was in mid plate, random, but notable. All right. And the next main thing would be the main board. And this is pretty subtle as far as the changes when compared to a DualShock board, but one of my favorite innovations is the fact that they use a USB Type-C connector and they moved the power LED to the main board. So before you had a daughter board that came off the bottom for the USB, um, there was another ribbon cable, now it's just on the board, they consolidated that out, they're able to fit it in nicely and that in the USB Type-C is just a much more secure connection. You can see the three switches for your mic mute button, your option in chairs, and then your thumbstick mechanisms. And on the back, everything here, pretty much the same. We have our connectors for all of our ribbon cables, um, a solder jumper for the Bluetooth antenna, our reset button here. Um, actually, the, the Realtek audio logo on that chip. That's kind of cute. And yeah, everything there without diving into specific chip manufacturers and um, you know, specking out each capacitor and resistor and transistor and figuring out where, what goes where, which let's be real, I'm not fully capable of doing. Um, I wanna stick to the more functional upgrade that is still here. So. The biggest problem we have seen with the DualShock would be the Y axis on these mechanisms going bad, so preventing you from sprinting, and then the X axis on the right stick going bad, giving you stick drift, um, you know, giving you slow turn. And the biggest thing they did, which makes so much more sense, such a simple upgrade is these mechanisms used to be mounted this way. And what happened, and what we have seen many times, and the, I mean, so to give you an idea, this, this mechanism is used not only in the DualShock controller, it is also used in the Xbox One, the Xbox One S, it's used in the Elite controller, it's used in the Wii U Pro controller, it's used in the Switch Pro controller. Um, this, I, it's used in the Astro C40 controller. This has been the go-to mech, it's from Alps USA, all they do are make components, um, specialty components, mainly for gaming, aerospace, automotive. You know, this is this is their baby. So this is what we've had. Um, the downside is this has been a problem for a lot of stick drift. I mean, we're seeing a lot of stick drift issues. The only notable upgrade to the actual mechanism I see here is that they changed the polymer of the side support. So, to give you an idea, this plastic piece just slides in. Before it was a gray plastic piece, it was a little brittle, and if there was force, so when you move this stick sideways and you click this direction, 
this little pink saddle on the inside will actually slide out of the controller a little bit and put force on this. And if these pins that hold it in on the side aren't strong enough, it snaps, it blows that out, and then this thing is just free and all over the place. The biggest issue we ever saw on that from a Call of Duty world standpoint in this little tiny corner of our universe that we're in um, on Xbox One in Advanced Warfare, you would have to move your stick in a direction and then click to do your boost movement. So when you'd click to the left, you were putting right force on it and you'd just blow that switch out. So that, you know, one good thing, that black piece being in there, hopefully it's softer, hopefully it's stronger. And then the other part is, let me get a little close here, but if you see the pink portion here, some tweezers just to point at it, this is what clicks the stick click down. So if you click straight down, it's clicking the switch down as it should, just straight down. As you move it forward, it clicks at an angle, and it's actually not clicking the switch all the way down. It starts to muffle the stick click. So it gave a lot of inconsistencies. You could open 100 controllers, and some of them would stick click amazing. You could sprint for days. Other ones, it would last a day, two days. It would just, um, it wasn't very consistent. So since I decided to turn it 90 degrees, not a huge difference. When you push forward to sprint, which is probably the most used function of your left stick click in any first person shooting game, um, you get a more satisfying click. And when the, the switch is being activated, it's being activated straight down. Your force is going straight down. So this switch on paper should last um, a lot longer than it did before. So I think part of the problem was it was failing prematurely because it wasn't getting hit straight on, not allowing the pieces inside the switch to do their job. So from our standpoint, luckily the mechanism itself internally is structured the same so we can do our tension modification so we can actually make the amount of resistance to move the stick left or right um, higher or much higher so increased or extreme so you take something like increased tension on the right stick and you put a control freak on top of it to make your stick taller it would fill about the same resistance because the height and leverage get some physics in there um, with a greater range of motion without it getting too loose and too sloppy, preventing some overshooting. So that, that'll be a huge benefit. Out of the gate, we'll be able to offer stick tension. So really excited about that. Um, we'll also yeah. notice one last thing, LED here at the bottom. So I think that goes to that mic mute button. And now we're gonna just put this back together. Earlier, the speaker fell out of the controller. So to put that in, you'll notice in the back, these two contacts sticking up. You need to touch your two gold contacts sticking up. So check the orientation, flip it over. That would put this block on the left-hand side. All right. And then we're just going to take the mid plate. We need to first put the mid plate into the face plate. So this is a little different. On the DualShock 4, I know especially in my shop, we would manipulate the mid plate with the main board inside of it as we're going through and doing our modifications. Um, the downside is we now have two screws that go through right here that you can only get to in the, the main boards out. So not a big deal. It's just going to be a small process update for people that do this all day. All right, so we'll slide that in. You want to make sure your ribbon where the touchpad goes through that rectangle. Press this down. Oh, there goes that speaker again. Okay, get that in there. Remember, your two longer silver screws go right here. And then you will use two shorter black screws on the edges. All right, and now 
for the main board. So main board, you want to make sure this microphone ribbon's back. Pull all your ribbons back and then you can lightly just press down on the board. Tuck your first ribbon in. Insert. Go to your sides. And when you're manipulating ribbons, again, try to use this hard plastic piece that's on the outside. You don't want to damage these as they are not, they're technically not even on the market yet. So there are no replacement parts. We will start to gain replacement parts as we start to break controllers in other ways. Um, but it usually takes us a few months to get a decent supply. All right, so we're going to get our rumbles. Get those put back in real quick. You'll notice me doing this a little sideways being left-handed and I have this camera it's got me twisted a little up all right so that gets our rumbles in we'll then put in our battery tray and you'll notice there's two hooks on the outside of the battery tray those go over your rumble cables there you go and that also leans up Right there and that's where your ribbon goes for or your, your ribbon your actual cable wires man for the the battery so take your rear microphone plug it back in here also curious to see how involved those little microphones are going to be if they're not necessary i could also foresee customers requesting to have those removed as People are always keeping their privacy a concern, so I think one too many jokes about your iPhone listening to you all the time has got us more cautious as to having microphones and cameras on things. I've opened this one too many times. All right, so it snaps or it pushes into this corner it sits in that there we go all right it's in it's all the way flat that's what we're looking for so definitely don't try to rush it do it right plug that in tuck it under that clip push it down here, clip it in up top, and then you'll notice you'll want to watch your gap on the side, press down firmly, and then make sure these two clips re-engage down at the bottom. So now your controllers snap back together, get your four screws back in. Not often do we do teardown videos. The Battle Beaver at all, but even for just from watching teardown videos, not often do um, people go back and reassemble whatever they take apart. Usually they take it apart, talk about it, and just scoop all the parts into a box for later. So half the fun's putting it back together. All right, we'll pop our bumpers in here. And to put this accessory piece in, you just slide this down. The little pieces will hook in to that hole. Start by pressing the middle part in. Does not take a lot of force. It is thin. You can break it, I'm willing to bet. And then work it outside and then snap over your back to hole covers. So there you got it. Uh, that's how to take apart, put back together the dual sense. Gives you an idea of some of the components on the inside, a little bit deeper dive. If you have any questions for me, you can comment below, uh, shoot us in an email, or you can message me directly on Twitter or at me. My personal Twitter is at Hangry Beaver. 
if you want to see about company news at Battle Beaver C on Twitter. And then we would love to get into doing more content, but we can't do it without some support from you guys. So if you don't mind subscribing, following our channel, giving us any input, letting us know what you want to see, um, what you like and don't like about controllers and what we can come up with in the future. Uh, we want to be here for everyone. So thanks for watching this video.